So I'll begin reading there in Psalm 63. And it, um, in my Bible, it has a heading on it that says it's David's thirst after God's service in his sanctuary. And it's a Psalm of David <clears throat> when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, <clears throat> my lips shall praise thee. <clears throat> Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth, they shall fall by the sword, <clears throat> they shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God, every one that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. I want to kind of preface this, up, preface this up front by saying I may not get through the entire psalm tonight. And if I don't, that's, that's fine. Those that have been, in with, been with me in Sunday school know that that kind of happens frequently. I don't get through all of <clears throat> the material. But hopefully there is some things in here that God has impressed upon my heart that will do us good if we take the time to look at them. The first thing that I noticed as I was studying this psalm <clears throat> As I, as I read it, and it starts off, it says, O oh God, Thou art my God. Um, and I'm not trying to, to, to show any knowledge. I had to look this up myself. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I do recommend that blue letter Bible dot com. But I'm going to read it as, I'm going to substitute some words, and we'll substitute the original words. Because it's in our English, it just sounds like repetition, because it says God twice. <clears throat> but as it reads in the Hebrew, it would read like this, O Elohim, thou art my El. They're two different words. And it's very interesting that they're two different words. Elohim implies a plural. So just a little side note there for any of those who say that, you know, the Trinity is definitely a New Testament concept you could take them here and say, then if the Trinity is a New Testament concept, why is David referring to God in the plural form? He is acknowledging that there is a plurality to the deity that he's talking to. But El is strength. O oh God, thou art my strength. Thou art my power. Thou art the thing that I can rely on. <clears throat> it is important for us to remember that as Christians. If we have any power, it is through God. If there's anything about me, it is through Him. I never want to be anything but a pale reflector pointing back to God. David acknowledges that. If I have any hope, if I have any chance in this life, it rests in God. You are my strength. You are what I rely on. <clears throat> now, to put this in the context a little bit, at the beginning of the psalm, it says he's been in the wilderness of Judah. Most people think that's when he's fleeing from Absalom. We don't know that for certain. I don't know that it matters. Because as I read this psalm, it began to dawn on me, when does this psalm not apply? It doesn't just apply in times of distress. Life is distress. Life is a battle. 
the day-to-day is the grind. So the concepts that we're going to look at here tonight that David lays forth in this psalm, I can't find a time when I shouldn't be doing them. And David noted at the very beginning there, he said, I will seek you out early. The beginning of the day, I seek the Lord. Why? Because he is my strength. He is the one that I fear. If if this is the time in David's life when he's fleeing from Absalom, he's got a lot to be concerned with. People are trying to take his life. And yet he said, I seek the Lord. Jesus told us over there in the 12th chapter of the book of Luke, he's talking to the people about how to order their lives, and he says, you worry about the Pharisees, you worry about this and the Romans, and you worry, you worry, you worry. He said, but whom you need to worry about is the Lord. Because the most that the Romans can do is kill you. But God will hold your soul accountable. So, fear God. And that's how David says I should start my day. I I like, I found a a quote that I like from Simon uh, DeMuy. He says, early in the morning before all things God is to be sought. Otherwise he is sought in vain as the manna unless collected at early dawn, dissolves. The first thing that we do in the morning is we seek the Lord. Now, put a mark in that and keep that in the back of your mind because I'm going to come back to that and I'm going to reference that many times as I get down through these verses. But He continues on there in verse 1, and he says that he seeks after the Lord as if a man who is in the desert and is thirsting for water. I find it very interesting, for those of you who may be a little more into the numerology side of the Bible, and I won't say I'm very heavily into that, but I do find some things that are interesting, things that I can't ignore. And, And one of the things that I find very interesting is if you look in all of Psalms, David uses this concept of thirsting after God three times in the book of Psalms. I find that interesting, considering that we believe in a trinity. But he said, I thirst after the the Lord as if a man who is in the desert where there's no water. That is how much I desire to be of the Lord. It reminds me of a story, and I'm I'm notorious for stories, and I'm sorry. My wife says it's because I'm a Southerner. But I was working with a boy, man, and his upbringing was not like my upbringing. His upbringing was very refined, very, you might want to say, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. I told him one day, I said, I can give you the best tasting Coca-Cola you've ever had in your life. And he looked at me, he said, how? I said, well, you just have to trust me. I said, won't you come to the house Saturday morning about 8 o'clock? And uh, I said, this this was in the summertime. I said, we'll have that Coke at about 12, 30, 1 o'clock. He said, it takes that long to prepare it? I said, oh, no, no, it doesn't take hardly any time. A Coke will be prepared by the time you get there. He said, well, what are we going to be doing from 8 to, to 1? I said, splitting wood. <clears throat> I said, after about four or five hours in the heat, splitting wood with a go devil, that'll be the best tasting Coke you've ever had in your life. I guarantee. If you've ever been out in the southern heat working, sweating, you know what that, a good cold glass of water, how the body just responds to that. 
how that physical desire is there. And yet David is saying, Lord, this is how I respond to you. It is to even say that it is a desire, I think is an understatement. David here is saying, Lord, it is a physical need I have for your presence. I need it. It is so much, Jesus paints this picture for us when he tells, he looks that old rascal in the eye and he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is a need. And without it, we shrivel up, we atrophy, we grow weaker and weaker. We need to seek the Lord. And David gives us reasons that we should want to and desire to seek the Lord, to see thy power and thy glory. The Lord is worthy to seek out. To put it into another, maybe a more simpler phrasing, God is worth getting to know. He is imminently worth getting to know. One of the things that breaks my heart so much about our modern church, about how we teach people about God, do you want to know, do you know, and I'm going to speak to men because it's my perspective, but men, if we talk to our wives like we talk to God, we wouldn't stay married long. Take note of this, Brady, because you're, you're, you're new in this realm. But if this, is the, this is the, if this is the way you talk to Emily, and it's the only way you talk to Emily, she gonna, she's going to pull every hair out of your head, and she has a right to do so. Fix breakfast, fix dinner, make my bed, wash my clothes, Love you. Bye. Now, how good is that going to work in our marriages? But do we not treat God that way? Do we not treat God like a McDonald's drive through We pull up to our prayer closet and say, I want a miracle, two blessings, to heal somebody for me, and can I have a side of fries? Make it snappy, God. I'm in a hurry. Be on our way. When was the last time that we sit down and said, Lord, I desire to get to know you. What do you think about this? What is your input on this, Lord? Because he's infinitely worthy to get to know. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Interesting how he wrapped up two attributes, two principles of righteousness in one word, loving kindness. God loves us. He does what's best for us, but he does it in such a gentle way. He does it in kindness. And we find that when we do that, we want, to be, we want to bless him. Our soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. What David is saying there is it's, it's that good of, it's a, that good of a Coke, guys. He's just using his own terminology. David's like saying, it's like sitting down to a banquet. It's satisfying. David does <clears throat> all of that. So he bookends something here. <clears throat> In the middle is he's talking about how good it is to get to know the Lord, how much worthy it is to get to know the Lord, <clears throat> the benefits and the joys of getting to know the Lord. But then on either side of the bookends, there are some conditions. There are practices. There are things that he gives us instruction on how to do. We already talked about the one. I will seek him early. 
First thing in the morning, Lord, I want to know what you have to say. But then in verse 6, he caps the other book in. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. When I get up in the morning, before I go to bed at night. And everything in between. When do we seek the Lord? That's not the question. The question is not when do we seek the Lord. The question is when should we not be seeking the Lord? I don't have an answer to that question because I can't find in Scripture where it gives me at the time that it says it's not a good idea to seek the Lord. Why do we think that the Bible says to pray without ceasing? When is a good time to not seek the Lord? When does that even make sense? Logically. <clears throat> but here's the thing that we need to understand and we need to acknowledge in the culture that we live. How many of y'all are busy? How many of y'all are so busy you don't know which way is up sometimes? <clears throat> I'll admit it. You know what they're finding out in teenagers? You know what teenagers suffer the, a lot from? A huge majority of our teenagers are suffering from? Burnout. Exhaustion, depression. They're teenagers. And yet, let me see if I can pencil you in. <clears throat> and we've even fallen into that mentality in our churches, in our walk with God. We are so busy, we, we try to, what we need to fit God in. I'll pray while I drive to work. I'll do my Bible reading through my earbuds while I'm, you know, on my treadmill. Is that the impression that we, you got when reading this scripture, that that's what David did? I got me six pieces of the Pentarch tattooed on my shield, and I read that while I'm in battle with the Philistines. No. Yet David said, I seek thee early in the morning. I seek thee late at night. Everywhere in between, I am focused and I am concentrated on, Lord, what do you want me to do? It is a priority in his life. <clears throat> and yet before we come back and say, well, you know, times are different. You know, they weren't as busy as we are back then. Let us, let us put this in the context. David is a king. Okay? When is a king not busy? When he wrote this, he was a king. Look at verse 11. But the king, he's talking about himself there. He is a head of state. When are they not busy? Have you guys ever noticed how much presidents age while they're in office? Have you ever taken the time to look at those, those guys' calendar? It's nonstop. They eat, sleep, and breathe the job. And just because David was way back a few thousand years ago doesn't mean his demands were any less. I mean, furthermore, David had multiple wives. That in and of itself is enough to keep a man busy. But you've got to worry about people poisoning you, assassinations. Oh, wait, it's the time when kings go to war. Got to worry about getting the troops marshaled up. The man was busy. The man had a lot on his plate. And yet he said, early in the morning I seek you. Late at night I seek you. Folks, I'm afraid too many times that our busyness are distractions. You may hear me reference this if you listen to me teach wrong because it is one of my favorite poems. <clears throat> 
But there's a poem that it begins like this. Distractions are the things that keep me from doing the things that I should. And each subsequent line is just a repetition of that phrase, but with a word or two dropped off. Until it gets to the last line, and the last line is, distractions keep me. It is a great tool of the devil to keep us distracted. Folks, the devil doesn't care for you to do some of God's business as long as whatever God's business is, isn't what God wants you to do. And you will never know that until you take the time to seek out God's will. He loves for us to be so busy we never stop to think and we never stop to consult God. Well, <clears throat> don't you think that's a little bit harsh? Teacher, don't you think that's a little bit not understanding of the current culture we live in? Let me challenge you with something. Look at how busy our lives are. And tell me we do not live in a lifestyle of chaos. And if we live in a lifestyle of chaos, how do we reconcile that with 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, where Paul tells us that God is not the author of confusion? If there is confusion and disorder in our lives, how are we seeking the Lord? If this is not the case, explain to me something. And, and folks, <laughs> I've said this about lessons, and this one's, e this one's even true. Every lesson I've ever taught, God gives me about three or four sermons to go along with it. And I'm just not saying that that's a sermon I want to get up here and preach. I'm saying God preaches me a sermon. A few nights ago, He woke me up at 2 o'clock in the, in the morning, or no, 1.30 in the morning preaching sermons to me on this. And about 4 o'clock I asked Him, I said, Lord, can you please stop? I'm about to die. But if we stay so busy that we are perpetually frazzled and perpetually exhausted, how are we giving God our best? Think about this with the concept of tithing. What are we to tithe? What's left over? We know that's not true. We saw that Sunday morning. Pastor taught on that. When Moses brought the tithe to Melchizedek, he brought the first 10% of the spoils. Nobody else got anything until Melchizedek got it. He brought the best. When we give God our service, do we give him the service of our best, or do we squeeze him in? Do we do it with intentionality? Do we do it with forethought? Or do we squeeze them in? If we're squeezing them in, that's not our best. And as I said, this hit me as, as hard, if not harder, than it, than it has you, than I'm presenting it to you guys. Because I look in my life and I'll see, and I'll say, Lord, when I sit down to pray sometimes, I'm just telling my wife this, I sit down to pray sometimes and I. You ever fell asleep praying? And there was a time in my life all it took for me to go to sleep was to get still. Now try reconciling that with your prayer life. All you need to do to go to sleep is just stop moving. But in prayer it's not really an active sort of thing. There's people that, when they talk about biblical concepts, they'll say, well, you know, I'm going to run a rabbit. I, I don't really like the phrase running a rabbit, because I used to have a dog. He's part beagle, and I'd watch him try to chase rabbits, and all he ever did was run around in the woods and exhaust himself. Nothing ever happened. I prefer to use the term chasing a pig, <clears throat> because if I'm going to chase a pig, I've got a very specific goal in mind. I want to get that pig back in the pen and have it grow up and become bacon. I want to get something out of the process. I may not accomplish it, 
but I'm going to try. So I'm going to try to chase a pig for a minute. Hopefully we'll get back in the pen. Let me ask a question. What is goodness? Anybody? Give me a definition for goodness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We better have a working definition for it. Galatians says, chapter 5, it's a fruit of the Spirit. What, what do we, when I say goodness, it, what do we mean? What do I mean by that? What does, the, scratch that, who cares what I mean? What does the Bible mean? What is goodness? Anybody? Hmm? God working through you. God is good. And I can certainly agree with that aspect of it. God is working through us when we do goodness. Anybody else? I'm a stickler sometimes for words and what they mean. They need to make sense to me. As I begin to study goodness, one definition that I came upon, m most of them were very similar to this, but uh, this definition resonated the most with me. The intentional act of doing right. Most definitions of goodness I found said something to the effect of, well, when you do something that's right, when you do, you know, you, you do something righteous, you commit a, a righteous act, that is goodness. But I like the definition of intentional act of doing right. <clears throat> because I would think about people, you can name all sorts of Hollywood types, politicians, they may do something, but they do it for their own glory. We don't, dis we don't feel that to be goodness. We don't feel like that's God working through us, right, Gary? I mean, that's, they don't, that's not God working through them. They're doing it for their own glory. So no matter what they may actually, no matter how many people they may feed, it, God doesn't get the glory. But when we set about to intentionally do that which is right, to intentionally do what thus saith the Lord, then it is goodness. So, if goodness is intentionally doing that which is right, then to haphazardly do things, to do things with very little forethought, would that not be the opposite of goodness? To treat God's work with carelessness, is that not the opposite of goodness? Remember when David tried to have the ark brought to Jerusalem the first time, a man lost his life. Why? Because David was careless with how he transported the ark, because he was careless in how he attended unto God's work. So, are we intentional about what we do? One of the things I always like in I have a certain fascination with the military, and one of the things that I'm always fascinated with is snipers. And it is amazing how those guys can shoot and hit a target from miles. Because they have this very specific goal in mind. They know exactly what they need to do, and they go and they execute that goal. But how often in the church are we intentional about what we're doing? Or do we do it in such a way that it's, it reminds me of an old Sean Connery quote. He was talking, they were talking about shooting and shooting style. Somebody said the American shooting style. And he said, American shooting style? American shooting style is spraying a bunch of bullets and praying you hit the target. How often are we like that in the church? 
We need to do, we need this, we need to do this. We, we, we need to have a children's ministry. We need to have, we need to have this singing and that and that teaching. And, and we've got to have this and that and that and that and that. And, and all the time the Lord's like, uh, what about I think? What about what I think? Oh, no, no, God, that's the time to ask you, Lord. We're too busy working, doing, moving, doing, moving, moving, moving. Moving, 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 but never doing what David said here. God, what do you think about it? I don't want to do anything unless it's what God would have me to do. Folks, I don't want to teach unless it's what God wants me to teach. I don't want to serve in the church unless it's what God wants me to do in the church. And I do not know this unless I put prayer as an essential part of my life. Communication with God. It is essential to use some of the buzzwords of the current time. And yet... And yet, how much have we deemed it to be non-essential? And I'm not talking, of, once again, I'm not talking about that drive through prayer. I'm not talking about when we take, two, we take 20 seconds out of our life and give God our list of demands and go on and wonder why He ain't fulfilled them. I was talking to a friend of mine, and we were, we were talking about this COVID stuff and you know, talking about church services and how churches have responded. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of churches, they do what, you know, we, we started doing here at Laurel Bank a, f- a few months ago is, you know, having a prayer meeting. It's a time where people get together and pray. So nothing unusual about what we did there. But I was talking to my friend about it, and it kind of came up that I was asking my friend about the, the practice of what was, was going on. Because I asked him, I'm like, why keep going to church to pray when nobody's there but you? Everyone else stopped showing up. Why, why continue to do it if it's just you? Can you, is praying at home not sufficient? Is, is, can, I not re, can I not reach the Lord in the dwelling of my home? Why, why go to the, the house of God to pray if it's just you? And this is what my friend looked at me and he told me and it, and it broke my heart. He said, has there been a time when that vehicle sat in the parking lot and somebody didn't drive by and see that form with its head bowed or see that form outside on its knees and know and have that testimony that at least somebody still reaches out and calls upon the name of the Lord and says, God, it is important what you think. It is important what you believe to be right. And I said, oh, my Lord and my God, how have I failed? Lord, I don't seek you enough. What you say matters. And God wants to talk to us. He said over there in Isaiah, he's begging with the people. If you look at it there... In that first chapter, he said, come, let us reason together. He's begging Israel, come, talk to me. Let's work this out. You, uh, the repentance is there for you. Forgiveness is there for you. Let us reason together. But we won't. We're too busy. We've got too much going on. And it's to our detriment. Folks, if what we are doing is so effective, 
why are we in such spiritual decay? And as if you need another reminder of how we're in spiritual decay, I got up this morning, <clears throat> probably shouldn't have, but I did. I got up this morning, looked at the news. I was just looking at national news. Didn't expect to see Tennessee in the headlines, but it did. And it was a story of how in Roan County, they pulled these three, these three children out of something that is written straight out of the depths of hell and found the body of a, of a precious little girl out in the backyard. And I told my wife, I said, I guarantee you I could stand on the front porch of that house, pull up a rifle and shoot a church. They're that close. You name me a place... Folks, I've, there's places in East Tennessee, I kid you not, you stand on one side of the road, you've got one church, you stand on the other side of the road, you've got the other church. we got churches galore. But if what we're doing is what thus saith the Lord, where is the fruit? God said, we have not because we ask not. And when we ask, we ask amiss so that we can consume it upon our lusts. Because we are not taking the time to get to know our maker. You know, we've been talking a lot <clears throat> about if we work for our salvation or we work because we're saved. Let me just give you my little analogy for it. If you've lived all your life as a pig and God changed you to a duck, are you going to quack trying to be a duck? No. You're going to quack because you are a duck. You just can't help it. But that comes from getting to know our maker. And when we know him, we'll oftentimes, a lot of our, some of our churches, some of our denominations will make a big deal about the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing thing to me. The Bible says of the Holy Spirit in the 16th chapter of John, that what will it do? What is its function? What is its purpose? Christ said, when I send this comforter to you, what is he going to do? He's going to guide us into all truth. A person filled with the Holy Spirit of God is seeking God's truth. It is a priority to him or her. It is a focus. We worry about so much. I worry about so much. But Christ... He told me there in the sixth chapter of Matthew, <clears throat> he told me, folks, he said, you worry about the food on your table, clothes on your back. You worry, you worry, you worry. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. This other stuff will take care of itself. Get to know the Lord. Take time to seek Him out. And you may be looking saying, but teacher, you don't, you don't know how busy I am. You're right, I don't. We're all busy. David was busy. But he took the time to find the Lord, to seek after the Lord. And folks, it is not an instantaneous process. You may look at it and say, there is just, there's no way that I have time to pray for an hour a day. I can't do that. Maybe you can't. Maybe that's, maybe that's 10 steps down your path. 
Maybe your first step, maybe your first thing in repentance is saying, Lord, yeah, I'm going to turn, and Lord, let me get five minutes, Lord. Help me figure out a way, Lord, to get five minutes where I'm focused on nothing but you. And see where God blesses. When you start dedicating that time and saying, Lord, I'm going to make it a priority. And it don't matter what, God. It don't matter, Lord, if my house is burning down. This five minutes is, is your time. Not, not some time, Lord, where I'm just going to give you off my laundry list. This is all the things, Lord, that I want you to do for me. No, Lord, this is the time, God, you speak to me. <clears throat> my dad left me with something <clears throat> about prayer. He said, son, here's something you need to always remember about prayer. He said, tell, tell God what's on your heart to be sure. Tell God what's in your mind to be sure. He said, but that's not the important thing about prayer. The important thing about prayer is not what you have to say to God. It is what God has to say to you. That's the important part. And you may sit there and say, well, I've prayed and I've tried to listen. And all I could come up with was one verse. There was a piece of scripture popped in my head and that's all I got. That's all you got? That's, we speak of that as if some little thing, that's all you got. That's the Lord. Be joyful in that. Build on that. He is faithful. He is just. When you read through the rest of this psalm, you see how as David <clears throat> put those bookends in place and made it such a priority to seek the Lord, he knew those that seek my soul to destroy it, they'll go in the lower parts of the earth. I got no worry about that. They'll fall by the sword. There'll be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But those that speak lies, eh, their mouth's going to be stopped. Why? Because David sought the Lord. Early in the morning, late at night, everywhere in between, what the Lord wants is what's important. That is the beginning and end of every question we need to ask ourselves. Lord, when we start talking about services, how they should function, what should go on, Lord, is this what you want? God, is this what you need us to do right now? That needs to be the overwhelming desire of our hearts as a congregation, as a church, as individuals. Lord, do you want me to take this job, Lord? Do you want me to quit this job? Lord, do you want me to, Lord, do you want me to move here? You want me to stay where I'm at? Lord, should I date this person? Should I not date this person? Should I marry? You better ask him if you should marry this person. Let everything that we do glorify the Lord. And if we put that as our chief aim, if we come to God with a broken and a contrite spirit, He will hear and He will pour out a blessing upon us that we cannot contain. Folks, I am not talking prosperity doctrine here. I'm not talking about God's going to pour out Mercedes and Jaguars. I'm talking about the blessing that David spoke of here. David said, I long after you, Lord. My heart desires you, Lord. 
God says, you come to me, you come seeking me, you'll find me. And therein is the best blessing that any Christian could ever hope to, to have. Folks, I have tested your patience enough, I believe, for tonight. <clears throat> Does anyone have a, a comment or a question or something they want to throw? If not, um, this is the time we normally do prayer requests. So we'll open the floor up for...